Back here at LaxCon with Greg Gerenlian from the Face Off Academy. And uh, Greg, uh, we, we finished up the National Showcase uh, not too long ago, uh, last month. You can see it on uh, video on demand. Uh, how, how It was an exciting tournament again. How, how pumped are you? Another successful year. Yeah, I mean, the National Showcase this year was a bigger venue, uh, a better situation, really impressive, really smooth. Everybody really had a good time. So I think next year we'll add a couple new things. But people want to check it out on the VOD. Yep. Uh, on this app. I mean, take a look. It's the best event of the year. Well, it's so crazy because I was down in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, one of the teams that was playing the U.S. U-19 team, Team Premier, there's Chase Mullins, who won it a couple of years ago, and he's taking face-offs against the best guys the U.S. has to offer, and it was it just cool to see that come full circle, and now he's playing against Team USA. Yeah, and, and, and not just taking the reps, but holding his own. Yeah. He's going to be a problem. He's going to be playing for Maryland, and they've got a stud. So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Very cool to see how that's expanded. What are you doing here at LaxCon? What's, what's been the big thing for you at the Faceoff Academy and, and continuing to improve the position? So this is the seventh year in a row we've been here. Um, Jerry and I, every year we come in and we introduce the FOA system, and people are like, well, are you going to talk about the same stuff? Faceoff rules change every two years, so there's always something new to teach. This year we took more of a drill approach, and we broke it down. Uh, basically, if you're – athlete has an in, uh, like a an in, inadequate motion or he's not good at something fixing it through drilling and we taught we taught our drills today so I know I saw this uh, pop up on Paul Carcaterra's Twitter and Instagram feeds, and he had you diagram what you would do for the college lacrosse face-off, because obviously there's talk about trying to get rid of it, limit, limit, um, limit the amount of, of effects that the face-off position can have on the game. Walk me through, what are the ideas you have that kind of even the playing field and make the face-off position a position that you feel like can continue to add value to the game and but feel like it's fair for the college coach because I think there are ones that don't have a great face-off guy that feel like it's unfair. Yeah, and, and look, I am in an interesting position because I kind of get attacked from both sides because I say it all the time. Let's be honest. There's a lot of people out there that are fine making a quick buck blowing whistles on face-offs. But when it comes to defending the position, it feels like Jerry and I are always the ones who are sticking our neck out. And I don't say things just like, oh, we should just keep the face off the way it is. Because let's be honest, there needs to be some tweaks. And I speak for what's better for the game. And, you know, for instance, 2015, I think it's safe to say, I figured face offs out when you could keep the ball in the back of your stick. Okay? Yeah, I had a great year. I was one of the people that said we should get rid of this. Because although it was good for me statistically, for the game, it was awful to just have the ball stuck, run into the back of the goal, and then pop it out. And I, it was hard to recruit because every kid looked the same. So every two years, we talk about tweaking the rules. Every two years, we do it without bringing in face-off guys to ask them what they think. Yeah. So my thought process was, objectively speaking, how can we keep the integrity of the position so that it requires no difference in technique for us, but we add another dimension? We have these wing lines that are 20 yards away from the face-off man. Why are we in love with the wing lines? We don't serve any other purpose. Yeah. So if we erase those off the field, we use the circle that's on 99% of the fields that we use anyway, which is a soccer circle. The reason I created the dimensions I did was if the women's, the women's have a draw circle, but it's a different size, it's similar to a 20-yard diameter circle that soccer has. But if we use that circle, now you're 10 yards away from the face-off guy anywhere. So if we want to add a fun dimension to the game, if your problem is a face-off guy winning the ball to himself over and over again, we're going to take one of those wing guys and we say, before the whistle, they can move anywhere. We're going to line it right up on the face-off guy behind him so we can't do that. Now you've incentivized the face-off guy to open it up to space and use his wings. But if you're a defender and you say, okay, last time he popped it here, now we're going to move our guys there. So now you've made a face-off guy, you've incentivized him to become an option quarterback. Pop the ball out, you can run routes, you can have guys go deep, you can even have guys go into the offensive end, but you've incentivized guys to get rid of it real quick. So my thought process was, let's get it rid of the lockups by using the PLL face-off rules where the ball's high on the plastic. Okay. And then incentivize guys to get the ball out into space because Say Trevor Baptiste goes 20 for 21 in a game by popping it to himself. We have a problem with that at home because it's boring to watch. But 
If he goes 20 for 21 because every time he popped it out, it was a three on three scrum. Well, that team earned it. It's incredibly impressive. Yes. So that's that's my idea. When you look at some of the top guys and what they're doing, whether it's college or pro, how many guys, and I, I mean, I guess like a guy like TD in particular that we see in the college game now, how many of those guys could still dominate if you had wings like that? Or would it be pretty dependent on how strong those wing play, players are? It comes down to your ability, rather than to just be a clamper, your ability to be a field general. So TD would then overnight have to demonstrate that he could pop the ball in precision to places on the field rather than just physically dominating a guy like he always does because he's a freak athlete. My point is people don't understand. You can change the rules as many times as you want. And I, I said this on Twitter. Between 2011 and 2017, I led the MLL in faceoff percentage every year through almost a dozen rule tweaks. The cream will rise to the top. It's always a technique that can be taught. So if you keep obsessing over this guy, it's not gonna make a difference. In fact, when they changed the rules, it made it easier for me because you got rid of cheating. But let's make this a three-on-three face-off. If I'm a college coach and I don't quite understand face-off guys and what they do, if I'm allowed to use my wings in a tighter space and be creative, it doesn't matter that much. I can still recruit. And what Jerry and I were saying last night was, it's going to give rise to different styles of face-off guys. So in football, you have an option quarterback or a run-first quarterback, RPOs, and you have a pocket passer. You're going to give rise to now, yeah, you have a knee-down guy who's a grinder. You have a guy who's more of a stand-up neutral grip guy. You have a guy who's a counter specialist. You're going to see a different variety of face-offs, which I think is going to be better for the game. Well, and I think you see in, in practice, it probably comes down to a fact where no longer do you just see a bunch of face-off guys on the side practicing their technique with a whistle or an app. You have a situation where you have to go out there full field, or at least in the middle of that field, get the wings, and legitimately, on a probably consistent basis, practice that position. Yeah. Yes, 100%. And you know what? The smaller space to work with, people are like, oh, well, they're just going to get beat up. No. First off, everyone relax because we haven't done it yet. <laughs> right. It was an idea. But two, the PLL was a perfect sample size. In the PLL, 10 yards in the middle of the field were taken out. And then the, the lines on the wings, the wings were actually a yard closer on either side. I had games where I didn't even try to clamp. I would just turn a guy into a place where he's not comfortable, and we would put the wing there ahead of time, and we went 70% in that game. You can't do that in high school and college because there's too much space. Right. So let's make it a three-on-three face-off rather than obsess with changing the rules every two years for the guy in the middle. And it really changes a man-down face-off. It almost makes it near impossible to do it if you've got somebody's got an extra wing there. Well, yeah, actually, it actually might make it easier for a man down. Okay. Because now, instead of the space is the problem. So if I'm a man down and someone asked us today in our presentation, how do you do a man down draw? We play it safe. We basically tell the faceoff guy, do your best, but we're going to stay in. Whereas if it's a tighter circle now, you might actually be able to guard three guys with two people, right? So you might say, rather than clamp, just stand up right away and we're going to try to zone this circle. That's fair. So, hey, maybe we say the draw circle is something only faceoff guys are allowed in until the ball's out. Maybe we say it's just a place to stand, but I think that's the dimension we should be looking at. So shrink the space and yeah. allow it to be a, a team aspect. I like that idea. Um, let's get to what else you got going on because I hear there's a podcast coming with, with you and Jerry Raganese. What yeah. are the details? So we haven't announced it yet. Let's announce it now. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, the official first announcement. Jerry and I are doing our own monthly podcast called Face Offs and Friendship in which uh, it'll be a, almost a PTI-style podcast where we will be talking about different subjects. Uh, we'll talk about uh, face-offs, of course, but current events in our sport because our calendar is 24-7 year-round now. Yep. And then we will also be talking about, we'll be bringing in a guest, uh, RJ Kaminsky, the voice of the PLL, will be our first guest, uh, which will be cool to see him on the other side of the situation <laughs> now. And then we will also be doing a Q&A, so anybody who uses the hashtag FO ask uh, on Twitter or Instagram. We'll be picking up questions each month that we like for that. All right. So people will look out uh, for the podcast, and I'm sure there'll be some food talk. There will be. I'm trying to get Jerry to do a bowl of ramen every single meeting so I can get some free ramen out of it. Yeah, there you go. But it will be on. It will be available soon. We'll be announcing on what platforms next Friday. All right. Well, at some point, maybe you'll interview me. 
Yeah, that's the goal. The script because I, you know, you're getting tired a, of asking. This is questions. a lot of work for me. I'm gonna make you do some work here, Greg. Appreciate the time <laughs> as always. Uh, you can see the Face Off Academy National Showcase on demand here on Lack Sports Network, and uh, we'll catch up again soon. All right. Always a pleasure.